And then uh, Valerie Kachu, who went to the school of preaching here in Denver, had uh, married a girl from the Ukraine. And uh, right now they're separated, but still they communicate and they have a child in common, they have a little girl. And uh, and they're on the floor, probably trying to sleep right now in the subway, which is deep beneath the earth there because they created the subway system there, getting ready for the American bombs, and, and uh, we never did. But now they're down there in the cold, trying to sleep, and uh, Julie, his wife, runs out every now and then and tries to go to her apartment that's only a block away to see if... Uh, she can get something to bring back to eat and things of that nature, water to drink. It's it's really pathetic. And uh, like I uh, mentioned, Bill, and Bill mentioned you, the work of the Lord in his church over in uh, the country of Ukraine is, is really doing well. There are a lot of congregations, more than in all of the other Soviet bloc uh, nations. And um, I had... Uh, the opportunity to talk to the preacher in Fargo, Texas, a, a little teeny tiny church, about 20 members that help us, help us in our mission work in Venezuela. And uh, he told me that his uh, cousin was from the Ukraine and uh, had passed away. And it was a family situation that kind of changed over time. But uh, that uh, he was aware that they were over that. This guy was a hard guy to convert. And yet he, after he married a girl from the Ukraine who was a Christian, he became a Christian, Jim Milius. And uh, that he'd been in communication with him. And uh, he and his wife weren't leaving. They were staying in the Ukraine and want to deal with whatever they had to deal with. And just all, all sides. I've had communication from different people telling me about those that they know and people that I've known in the past and uh, I, last night I didn't sleep a whole lot. I kept waking up and remembering other people that I know that are over there and going through all of this struggle and it, it's really sad and I do hope and pray that you will remember all of those people in your prayers especially right now today and tomorrow and until some kind of resolution and I hope peaceful resolution can come out of the conflict. But uh, a lot of great, wonderful Christian people are in that nation. I deliberately printed out the picture of one congregation, one group there, a uh, portrait of them, so that you could get an idea of uh, what it might look like to visit them. Jim and Dallas have an experience with that because uh, they have a family member there, Dallas' son, who Garth, who has worked with the Ukrainian people and goes back and does seminars and so forth. And so they are very much aware of what's going on in Ukraine. And uh, Masha is from that part of the world. And uh, I know she's also praying for all these Christians that are in that nation. So let's, let's keep our hearts in tune to their need and not be thinking so much about ourselves, but thinking about them because they're really, really need our help. Uh, and it all, unfortunately, fits into the message that we've been uh, reading about just now that what Paul shared with us about uh, how the devil works in our lives when he has an opportunity. But last week, as an introduction, I talked about being known in heaven, and it was, a, I think, a very upbeat, positive lesson. Glad that I could bring it to you and uh, talk about the fact that uh, when we become Christians, God knows us, and he knows us even before that. He knows us from the time we were conceived in our mother's womb. Jeremiah talked about that. Ezekiel talked about that. And so we know that we're known by God. But uh, also we're known by the angelic beings in heaven. But in uh, John uh, chapter 10, verse 3, when it talks about Jesus being the good shepherd, it talks about he, him calling his own sheep by name, and leads them out. God knows your name. He knows my name. And uh, it's special because we're Christians. We're his children. We belong to his family. We're told there's a, a total of one septillion stars in the universe. And I mentioned that. 
And yet God has named them. He not only created them, but he named them and he knows the names of those stars. And I have a hard time remembering names. I remember your, your name, but you're the only visitor I think we have that's here for the first time today. And we're glad to hear he's with us. But uh, that's one person. I can handle that for a little while. But uh, one septillion, which is equivalent to one, well, about 24 zero stars in the universe, and God knows all of them and calls them by name. Well, uh, he also knows us and calls us by our name as the good shepherd mentioned. And then our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, according to Philippians 4 3. There's a record. There is a record. Uh, we adopted Natalie when she was an infant, and uh, it was a, a real special time. But uh, I began to try to find out when she was born so we could get her certificate for her. That was in Venezuela. And uh, Natalie can tell you she can. Celebrate her birthday any day she wants to because they never could figure out uh, when she was born. But uh, the mother told us that it was probably toward the end of the month of November. So I, I told the people in the registry it was uh, put it down for the last day of November. And so they put it down for the 31st of November. <laughs> she was never going to have a birthday. <laughs> and so I had to go back and get another birth certificate, and her birthday is the 30th of November because I decided that's what it would be. But, uh, you know, it's interesting that uh, God has a book, and I went through the books, and the books that they put the records in are huge, monstrous books. And I took pages and took pages and looking for them. And uh, God has the Lamb's Book of Life where if you become a Christian, you were baptized for the mission of your sins and became part of God's family. Your name is in that book. And God doesn't forget anything. He doesn't need the book to remember you. But it's there. And your registry is in heaven. And then as you go to Luke chapter 19, verse 10, we read, There is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So when you go to heaven, if you're thinking you're going to be kind of sort of out of place there and nobody knows you and you don't know anybody, forget it. Everybody there knows you. Now, you may not know the name of all the angels, uh, Mike, Paul, and the others. You may be able to figure out eventually, but uh, they all will know you if you become a Christian and are a child of God. We are known in heaven. But then another question arises. Are you known in hell? And that sounds like really a hard, harsh subject. There's only one picture of hell. And uh, people get a little bit nervous about that. And uh, yeah, you don't need to. You don't need to. Because this is not a negative lesson we're talking about. We're talking about you as Christians. Are you known in hell? And a lot of people say, do you really believe there is such a place as hell? Well, uh, Jesus believed it. Uh, depart from me, Matthew 25 41 says, You who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. The Bible tells us that there is a place called Gehenna or hell, perhaps later. And that is horrible. The fire never goes out, the worm never dies. There's Fire, but not necessarily light because it's a place of darkness as well. And we read in 2 Peter 2 4 because it was stated that it was created for the angels that abandoned God and uh, the ones that serve Satan now. And we read in 2 Peter 2 4 For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, well, apparently Peter believed. In hell, and so did Jesus. But then in Matthew 5 22, this is a little bit alarming. And anyone who says, You fool, call your brother in Christ or out of Christ, or your physical brother, it doesn't matter. You call your brother another fellow human being, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Hell was prepared not for you and not for me, it was designed, constructed. 
set on fire and exist as a place for the evil representatives of the demonic world to spend the rest of eternity. But if you would like to join them, you may. All you need to do is just get in the habit of calling your brother a fool because that will entitle you to not be seen in heaven, maybe known in heaven, but you won't be seen because you're going to be in a devil's hell. But that's not what we want to look at. I talked to you about how you're going to be known in heaven, and that's what I want for everybody here to experience once you when you pass away, to immediately be carried away on the wings of angels and carried into the presence of God and recognize and called by name when you get there. They can show you in the book of life where you're registered. Oh, yeah, you got guys on this particular day. That was when you dumped all your sins and came to God for his mercy and grace and forgiveness and became a child of the creator of the universe. But then Jesus knows us, God the Father knows us, the Holy Spirit knows us, the angels know us. But on uh, one occasion, God, and I can't even think he was just sort of playing around with the devil on this occasion. I asked in Job 1 8, God speaking to the devil. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Have you have you checked him out lately? You know? Well, why would the devil want to do that? Well, I know why God wanted him to do that. There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. You know, that had to upset the devil to know that this guy is shunning evil because that's his special evil. But he, but God says, do you know it? And guess what? The devil did know Job. He really did. How do we know that? Because if you continue on in that chapter, you find that he says, yeah, yeah he serves you. He does what you want him to do. He's obedient. But that's because you have given him everything under the sun that he wanted. And then they get into a little debate. Well, what would happen if uh, you take all that away from Job? And what if you didn't give him all of those blessings constantly? Would he still serve you? The devil says, no, he won't serve you. He'll turn his back on you and just forget you. God said, no, he won't. And that's what the book of Job is all about. And uh, I had one commentator that I read that I loved. He said that uh, the problem with Job's situation was that he never had to read the book that carried his name, chapter one. He didn't know all this had taken place. All he knows is his world came apart and everything went bad. But God knew what was going on, and Satan knew what was going on. And Satan did everything he could to get Job to depart from God. Took away his family, took away his riches, took away his animals, took away his land, took away everything. And Job continued to be faithful like God said he would, because he was a man who was without evil. He didn't do the things that other men would do. And consequently, uh, Job proved that Satan was wrong and that God was right. But the point I'm trying to make is this. God knew who Job was. He could describe the life that Job was living. But the devil also had his opinion as to what the life of Job had caused. It, 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 you just gave him everything, and so he's been obedient to you. But he knew that. And we're known in heaven, but guess who else knows us? The devil. And he knew enough about Job to say, I don't think he would stay faithful. But he knew him. And so Job, because of his righteous life, was named by God directly in the presence of Satan and had an opportunity to prove his fidelity. So God knew Job, his servant, his faithful servant, but the devil also had been informed about Job before. He knew about it. Well, Jesus definitely knew Satan. We know that. The Bible is pretty clear on that subject. 
But uh, when you go into you know chapter four of Matthew, then Jesus was led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And so he's going to have a special session of temptation brought on him, just like the devil tried to bring down Job. Now he's going to try and bring down Jesus, and he's given the opportunity to do that. God says, Go ahead. The Father said, He's my son. Take him into the wilderness. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, and I've done a long fast before, but I never ever made it to 40 days and 40 nights. I might not have lived through it. But after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Are you surprised? The tempter came to him and said, If you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God, the word of God, that sustains. And we're going to find as we continue on in another section here of the scriptures that the word of God is our sustenance and it's our defense against Satan in all circumstances. But then the devil wasn't finished tempting Jesus, carries him up to the highest part of the temple and says, Why don't you three sit down? And uh, the Bible says, God's taking care of you, but you can check it out and see. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, just jump. For it's written, and this is true in the Psalms, he will command, he will command his angels. Concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Nothing bad is going to happen. Jesus answered, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. You're not supposed to tempt God, test God, try God, prove that He's right or wrong. You're not supposed to do that. But again, you go back to the Word of God to defend Himself. And in Matthew 4, 8 through 11, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. Right now, with the situation we're facing with Russia and the United States and other countries and the leaders, political leaders everywhere, it's a struggle. But uh, they all have seen the kingdoms of this world and they all want them. Jesus wasn't interested in that. He wasn't going to be tempted by that. And he, and he answers again from the word. All this I will give you, Satan says, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. And so when we ask the question, well, did Jesus really know Satan? Oh, yeah, he really did. I mean, that was quite a, an interview there that Satan had with Jesus. So, is Jesus known in hell? Well, that's a given, and we know that that's the case. But here, in reading about the temptations, we can appreciate just how well he had experienced the devil and all of his temptations and how he did victorious over Satan. But then he sends out 72 people to go and teach. Disciples. Jesus did. In his ministry. And then they come back all excited. And uh, we read in Luke 10. The 72 returned with joy. And said Lord. Even the demons. Submit to us. In your name. He replied. I saw Satan. Fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority. To trample on snakes and scorpions. And overcome all the power. Of the enemy. That would be so. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you. That's not the greatest thing that has happened to you. But rejoice that your names are written in heaven. It's exciting to know that the demons are afraid of you. It's exciting to have this conflict and come out victorious. But he says, it's more important that you be known in heaven and that you know that you're known in heaven than to say, well, I'm known in hell. I've had my conflict with Satan and I've won and he knows me. That's, that's important. But uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 12 tells us what we can expect in this life. 
Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, the power that God used. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world. Boy, we live in a dark world. And against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Earthly and heavenly. We have a battle on our hands. But you know, Romans 8 37 says that we can be more than conquerors in Jesus. You go to the book of Revelation, you look at the, you know, the opening of the book of Revelation, and you get these letters to the different churches of Asia Minor. And in every case, we're told that those who overcome, those who overcome, those who will overcome, and it talks about all the different. Things they can expect as a reward from God because of his grace and his generosity, his kindness, his liberality. And, and so it says, you're blessed. You're blessed. And you will be overcomers. You will be more than comforters. And so we put on the whole armor of God. And you, you've read this before. And you know it talks about the helmet of salvation. And it talks about the breastplate of righteousness. And our belt of truth. And our shoes that are the gospel and how we have the shield of faith to protect us from Satan. And, but all of those things are spiritual elements, even the sword of the spirit, which is the only one member or part of the, the equipment we have, that, that's something that uh, is aggressive, everything else is defensive. But that's our weapon to go against Satan is the word of God. So we have the word of God that is going to protect us and we have the word of God that we can use as a weapon against Satan. But we don't fight with our fist. We don't take and bite, scratch. We don't have that in any physical contact. Our battle is a spiritual battle. And it's all based on whether or not we read the word, understand the message, and are obedient to God. But I want to read something uh, that I really enjoy every time I go through the scriptures and look at it. In Acts 19, 13 through 16. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were possessed, demon possessed. Now, when you read that just you know, on the surface, the very beginning of this context, you think that these guys were actually casting out demons. They weren't. I've, I've seen this in every country I've been in. People who claim that they're running the devil out of people's lives and that they're uh, casting out the demons. And uh, we even had one brother in Venezuela who decided he could do that and he's been proven to be false. But it, it's a real good way to make some money. A real good way. Matter of fact, one of the guys who was converted out of one of the tribes in Africa confessed out of Nigeria. He confessed that he had been one of those sorcerers who were casting out demons and uh, saving people from the devil. But then they asked him about it. Well, this is after he became a Christian. Why did you do that? And how did you do that? He said, that's easy. All you got to do is just put a spell on somebody, abracadabra, open sesame or something. And, and then after you said whatever you want to say, you poison at night. You find out a way to poison. And they die. And the next day, everybody fears you because they say, oh, he put a spell on George over there and look what happened to him. I saw the same thing happen on the island of St. Vincent when I was working there. A lady that was a member of the church went to the bank where she had been working as a secretary and there was a pen on the table and it was her pen and it had a piece of tape on it and on it there was an X. Oh, an X. And Veronica lost her mind over that. Scared to death that she had been x out by a demon. And uh, it bothered till I saw her actually go down to the hill dressed in this white jacket that had her hands trapped and could take care of it away from the insane side. Fear, fear, fear. These guys use fear. Shakespeare called 
one of his writings about the people of Ephesus, the city of Ephesus, and said even in his modern times, they were, they were still given to worshiping demons and casting out demons and doing all kind of diabolical things. But uh, here we find that uh, the scriptures tell us in the book of Acts, these guys and uh, some of these Jews in the city of Ephesus are actually trying to cast out demons. They were sorcerers. They were fake. But they, it's a good way to make money. And uh, they would say, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Sounds good, doesn't it? You already got Jesus uh, in, thrown in there. You got Paul the apostle thrown in there. They knew that Paul had really cast out Satan and his angels for people's lives that where they do their diabetic, diabolical ways and uh, ruin people. And he, and he says, in the name of these guys, they, they want to make a show. And so in the name of Jesus, then Paul preaches and cast out demons, okay? And it didn't work for them. Seven sons of Sheba, who was a Jewish chief priest, were doing it. They decided that they would get in that game. It's very lucrative, and we'll just cast out demons. One day, the evil spirit answered them because you see, the problem is that in the time when Jesus was here on this earth, God did allow the devil to have kind of a free run for a little while so that uh, Jesus could be tempted and prove that Satan really isn't as powerful as he thought he was, and that you can be victorious over him. And things like that were actually taking. Place. It's not that they were mentally ill and, uh, you know, I heard all kinds of excuses, but uh, the devil actually was in our world, and uh, Jesus proved that he was worthless and incapable of doing all that he wanted to do. One day, the evil spirit, oh, we got these guys that are trying to cast out demons, and all of a sudden, a demon, a real servant of Satan, is approached and, and they're trying to get rid of the enemy. And, and, and what do they say? Jesus, uh, you know, that preaches Paul and Paul who preached Jesus in the name of Jesus and Paul come out. Okay. Um, and so the evil spirit that was in this person, a real actual demon possession situation, one day. The evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? I don't know you guys. Who are you? Running around saying, come out. And I know Jesus is. Our leader had a big battle with them back at the beginning of his ministry, yeah. And I know Paul is, oh my goodness. That guy has caused us so much misery. He's brought so many people to repentance and brought them into the kingdom of God and got them forgiven of their sins and started churches here, there, and everywhere. I know who Paul is, but, but, but who are you to tell us to abandon this particular man and cast us out? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Victorious. Now the question is, are you known in hell? What are you doing to make the devil worry? I've been in this. I have been there. And I've been concerned sometimes that probably the devil doesn't worry about me because I'm not doing anything that would disturb his plans or upset his wagon. No. But what could you do? What could you do to really be recognized as a significant warrior of the Lord before the eyes of Satan? Guess what? You did the right thing this morning, didn't you? You got up, you got dressed, and you came down here to study what? The Word of God, the Bible. 
And that's what we're looking at, the, four, the verses we've been reading. And I love reading verses. Some people say you did all the preach, 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 and not read so much. But hey, that's where the power is at. It's in the word. So what Jesus used, he quoted a lot of scripture instead of just elaborating on the things he had experienced in life and what he thinks is really cool, the fluff and all of that other stuff that goes into sermon sometimes. No, just get down to the word of God and that was all. And that was sufficient. It's powerful. And consequently, he was victorious. But you got up and came down here to study the word of God. And that's what we've done. And that's what we do every Lord's Day. You took the Lord's Supper. And that was also according to the will of Jehovah God. That you remember his son and how he died on the cross for you. And uh, so he did the right thing. And then the preacher went too long this morning, but you stayed anyway. I'm glad you didn't walk out there. And, uh, but you put up with it. Because you're here to serve God. And you think the devil doesn't know it. And you know when you sin and you feel broken and you go ahead and confess it to God and ask for forgiveness and he forgives you. You think he forgets that? No. You can really mess Satan up by repenting of your sins and rededicating your life to God even if you've gone into the depths of an evil. And you'll you'll be you'll be known by Satan if you do the things that God wants you to do. And so we need to look at you know the people that we haven't talked to yet that we ought to try and convert and teach. And then when you do, and then you get to baptize them, and uh, you get to see them become children of God, start coming to church with you. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. And you're upsetting the plans of Satan. And you will be known where. Not only in heaven, but in hell also. So, you know, somebody said, Marshall. And uh, they said, no, 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 no. Let's, let's change that. No, no, no. Patricia. No, no, let it die. Masha. No. And cold red ones. You know, names like that shake up Satan and ruin his day. Because he knows who you are. And he knows instead of sleeping in today and forgetting about church and not thinking the Lord's Supper and not even worrying about who else might come or not come or meet here or not today. You know, that we will see, you know, and I told him so big time outside. You know, those things matter. And it matters to God. And when we become Christians, our name is written in that last book of life. And God knows us and he can call us by name. If he can handle that many stars and remember their names, I'm sure he can remember ours if we decide to serve him. But it would, isn't, it, isn't it wonderful to think that we not only can have a, a reputation in heaven, but have a reputation in hell? And we would say, well, yeah, I know. I know, I know Jesus. I know Paul, and I know Bill, you know, isn't that, isn't that sweet, the thing that that can be the case? Then somebody is pretending to be a Christian, would be embarrassing, so that I don't know who you are. You sure you're a Christian? We can answer that question, what can we do to have a reputation be known in hell as well as in heaven? Let's Let's shake hell up. Anybody in agreement? Yes. Let's rock the boat. I know you've been broken like me from times when you just feel so bad. Why did I do that? Why did I say that? Why was I thinking that? And you feel ashamed of yourself, but you can repent and you can turn to God and God will forgive you and restore you 100%. And then you can feel comfortable in His presence instead of embarrassed and you, you can say I think the devil knows who I am you raise your kids up to be wonderful Christians and you can say I bet you the devil saw that you quit drinking and say no thank you and the, the devil was will be shook up by that and God will see it 
you you can ask somebody, hey, why don't you come to church on Sunday? I think you'll enjoy. It. I think you'll get a lot out of it. It helped me a lot. You can do that. And guess what? The devil will see it just as much as God. And your name will always be in the last book of life. It's going to be in the devil's too. And it's right down there. Stay away from this guy. Yeah. But you can be more than a conqueror in Jesus. So it's, it, I just thought of how one from the way to preach on. Known in heaven. But then I thought, yeah, but I got to come back with a follow up on that and use this verse. Talk about being known in hell to uh, let's shake hell up and make, make a mark for ourselves there. Uh, the devil knows that it's a waste of time to come and tempt me. And that's what Jesus did. He, he showed him how he was really did. God bless you. Love you so much. Bill said that uh, he would close us out tonight. Uh, today, excuse me, I ain't got the night yet. The sun's still shining. But I could go to the night. So, love you guys. Thank you, Bob.